Good morning to everyone in the room and uh, good morning to people at the end of uh, various forms of media. Um, my name is James Powell, I'm the CTO for Thomson Reuters and we've been doing this uh, series Tech Vision where we bring in speakers um, and tonight we're very lucky, or today I should say, we're very lucky to have Alistair who's going to talk to us about lean analytics. Um, fan fascinating subject, I think uh, everyone will find it interesting. Um, I should mention some brief housekeeping, uh, turn off your mobile devices, um, and um, at the end we're going to do Q&A, so I'll try and save your questions uh, to the end. Um, we've had some great speakers before. I think uh, today's segment is going to be a really interesting topic, not just about how the businesses, how businesses can think about analytics, but also how startups can think about analytics and how we can, um, how we can bring some startup culture inside Thomson Reuters. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, Alistair is the author of uh, a book, maybe you picked up a copy outside, Lean Analytics, um, which has uh, done better than even he expected, um, uh, off the back of a book called Lean Startup, I think it's really started to get traction. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur, speaker, thought leader, has worked on a variety of topics from web performance, big data and cloud computing to startups. Uh, in 2001, he founded uh, Corridient, uh, which was acquired by BMC in 2011. And since then, he's also worked on several other early stage um, startups. He's the chair of the uh, O'Reilly Strata Conference and um, at the Montreal International Startup Festival. So please join me in welcoming Alistair today. Thanks, sir. That the book did better than my expectations just means I have low expectations. Um, before we get started today, uh, I just think it's important to acknowledge that um, Nelson Mandela passed away, and uh, to have been incarcerated for decades and have missed the life of your family and to have come out of that wanting peace overwhelms me. So someone really amazing has passed, and I think we should all be thoughtful of that. So with that, on to some um, slightly, more, uh, slightly less sobering and more uplifting topics. Um, Lean Analytics is a book that I wrote as a response to um, an experience that we had uh, building a startup accelerator around the lean startup model. And I'm going to talk briefly about what that is, and then I'm going to talk about how some of that applies in larger organizations. If you've seen the lean startup model, how many people here have read the book, The Lean Startup? So I'm going to tell you a very short version, but you should still go read it. Um, it is that companies succeed by iterating very quickly through a cycle of having an idea which they build the minimum viable product to validate, measuring what they did, learning from it, and then building something that is closer to their ideal fit between a product and a market. That's the shortest explanation of the book. Uh, a slightly longer version is to say that Kevin Costner is an awful entrepreneur. Now, I should point out he himself actually isn't, but in the field of dreams, he tells people, if you build it, they will come. This is, to use the formal term, horse pucky. Um, you should not try to sell what it is you're able to make, but rather you should try to make what it is you can sell. Uh, in his words, that would be, if they come, you should build it. We wrote Lean Analytics because uh, we believe that we're all liars. You're all liars, I am too. We are all very self-delusional. And that wonderful cycle that Eric Ries talked about in the Lean Startup has a problem, which is that everyone thinks their idea is the best. People love the part of building it, particularly early stage companies founded by people who have an itch to build something. They tend to fail to measure the right things, and as a result, they don't learn and they don't iterate. And so we are plagued by innovations nobody wants. Mark Andreessen famously said, markets that don't exist don't care how smart you are. <clears throat> the term of analytics as a whole is how we measure the movement of your customers or your users or your constituents towards the goals your organization has in place. In a startup, an early stage company that doesn't know what products it is selling to what markets, the goal of analytics is to iterate around that cycle faster and faster until you find the fit between a product and a market before your money or your patience runs out. The most basic thing to remember about a metric is that if you have a metric and it's not going to change your behavior, it is inherently a bad metric. You, are, you should not be collecting it. Anytime you collect a KPI or a metric or a measurement, you should know what it is you will do based on the result. So I'm going to talk a little about how to be more disciplined in your analytical infrastructure. Let me give you a concrete example of this. In this table, you can see three different models of uh, consumer loyalty. If you survey the customers in a store or an online store, and you say, what percentage of those customers buy from you a second time in 90 days? If that number is below 15%, you are in acquisition mode, e-commerce or retailer, and most of your resources 
go towards getting customers buy, to buy from you a single time. <coughs> Excuse me. At the other end of that spectrum, if many of your customers buy a second time within 90 days, you are a loyalty-focused e-commerce <coughs> provider or retailer. And as a result, you need to focus on things like getting people to return. Now, consider what you would do from a marketing standpoint here. If you're looking at the first of these groups, you probably want to focus on maximizing shopping cart size. You may be selling wedding rings. A wedding ring is something that, unless you've got a very unusual customer, uh, you probably don't buy more than once or twice a year. Well, once or twice a lifetime, hopefully. <laughs> and so as a result, if you're targeting your marketing, you probably don't want to offer refunds if the wedding is off. You probably need to throw in insurance and cleaning services and photographs and whatever else. Whereas if you're at the other end of the spectrum on the loyalty side, you're a retailer doing green grocery and, and uh, weekly produce delivery, and someone complains that the fruit was rotten, make a, hand, make a basket of delicious fruit and hand carry it to them and apologize because you want a customer for life. You wouldn't build things like wish lists into an acquisition-focused e-commerce company. So it's a very simple metric, right? What is my, how frequently do customers buy from me a second time in 90 days? And I've got a set of numbers here. This is based on in, uh, research across a number of companies. And simply knowing that number changes my entire marketing strategy. Yet almost none of the e-commerce providers I've talked to look at this number. Metrics should change our behavior, and we should know how they're going to change them beforehand. One of the most important things to understand when you're analyzing metrics is how to analyze and crunch the data about your users. So here is, in a very short form, uh, some of what you need to know about analyzing and segmenting users. Consider these five bands of traffic uh, or user ad adoption. Over on the left, I've got my first month, the light blue bar. And then each month subsequent to that, I have another group of customers that joins me. So if I slice across these customers, this, for example, is my April cohort. So the first wedge at the bottom is my January users, and they arrive, and then they gradually drop off. And then the February, the March, and the April users, and so on. Now, if I were to slice across those users, cross-sectionally, and say I want to test something on those users, I'm testing January, February, and March's users across <coughs> these uh, segments, I'm going to be able to compare them. Are they users that, that used it on a cloudy day versus a sunny day, or users that saw a red versus a green button? And I might combine those things and do what's called multivariate analysis, where I say, let's, let's have a look at people who saw a red button on a sunny day versus a green button on a cloudy day, and see which factors in their experience most affected um, how they experienced the application, whether we did what they wanted to, whether they bought the thing or subscribed. These four things, cohort analysis, which is called a longitudinal slice across the data, segment analysis, the vertical stuff, A-B testing and multivariate analysis, are at the core of crunching and analyzing your data. Let me explain why they're so important. Uh, sorry, um, I'll explain why they're important in a second. So I want to talk briefly about the stages of uh, lean analytics. So when we wrote the book, we realized uh, in talking to a number of startups that all companies go through a series of stages. And if it's a later stage company launching a new product, that product needs to go through those stages. Our first inspiration for this was something that Eric Rees wrote in the Lean Startup book. He says there's three ways that online businesses or technology startups make money. Uh, the first is stickiness. Simply put, you get people to keep coming back. And the way you measure this is, are you getting customers faster than you, can, than you lose them? Pretty simple, right? Um, the second one, virality, is getting other people to tell their friends about your product. Viral growth, you've all heard that expression. And the measure here is how fast they tell their friends um, and how many of them tell their friends in the first place. Uh, and then the price engine of growth or revenue engine of growth is basically taking some part of the money you've acquired from customers and spending it on um, acquiring new ones. And the math here is do customers cost you more? Uh, are they worth more to you than they cost to get? So, those uh, three factors figure prominently in the stuff we talk about in the book. There's another very smart uh, startup analyst named Dave McClure, and he talks about this customer lifecycle behavior. Um, he puts together acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and revenue. If you put those together, it says R, and because David is a very funny person, he calls this pirate metrics. We think he's really clever. We don't think he's a good artist, so we drew it properly like this. Um, but if you look at the stages that companies go through, there's the acquisition, which is how do you first hear about me. The activation, you come by my site, do you log in or subscribe? The retention, do you keep coming back? The revenue, did I make money from you? And the referral, virality. And while I'm obviously focusing on tech companies here, this works just as well for a restaurant. A restaurant naturally has a point where you become aware of it, where you consider going there, you actually uh, have dinner, and then later on tell your friends. And one of the most important things here is, as a company or a project grows, the risk changes. So at first, your risk is, is there a real need? 
Have I identified a market for which there's a need? This is probably not your existing customers. It's probably some adjacent market. The next question is, do I have the right solution? Have I figured out something to offer to satisfy that need that people are going to pay for? Do I have a good product for it? Have I solved that need in a way they like? Have I found a sustainable business in a healthy market and ultimately found a successful exit? And so we rolled all of these different ideas up into what we call the five stages of lean analytics. The first stage is empathy, get inside your customer's head, understand the need and the um, solution that's going to be acceptable to them. Stickiness, build the very first version of that product and keep iterating until people consistently return to use it because there's no point at throwing marketing dollars in something until you know people will use it. Virality, which is convincing them to tell their friends. Uh, revenue, which is spending some of the money you're making to acquire new ones through inorganic means. And then finally, scale, automating and systematizing and, and so on. These are the five stages we talk about in the book. So let me give you examples of a couple of startups that have done this in unusual ways. Local Mind was an early stage company that was part of an accelerator in Montreal that I helped run called Year One Labs. Local Mind was built on this idea that you could ask a, pl a place questions. In other words, I could ask Times Square, you know, where is there good Wi-Fi or where should I eat? And I'd get an answer back. And normally to build this app and test this, that's a pretty risky hypothesis. Will strangers answer questions from strangers? So how do you test that? Most people would sit down, write code, take a while, launch it. These guys didn't write a line of code. Instead, they looked at geofenced tweets coming out of Times Square. And they asked strangers, because if you can get a New Yorker to ask, answer a question from a stranger, anyone will do it, right? They asked strangers, um, hey, is there good Wi-Fi? Where's the nearest subway? Is there somewhere around for coffee? And they found that roughly 95% of complete strangers answered a question. So they were able to de-risk that hypothesis in one day with no lines of code. This is a pretty effective way to take one of your assumptions and do something experimental for no money that tells you whether or not you're right. A big part of startups is articulating your assumptions properly and then finding these cheap, subversive ways to de-risk those elements so that your business model is more accurate. Slightly later in the process, another company called Kidic was making a tool to survey people. So imagine I ask this room full of people a question. I get all of your email addresses. I send you a mail. Well, their initial model wasn't very good because I'd send you all a mail, you'd install an app, you'd log in, then you'd get the question, you'd vote on the answer, and I would then see the results. And they were getting pretty bad conversion rates. They were getting conversion rates of around 15 to 20%. They were kind of despondent. And so in a last minute meeting when they were wondering what to do, I said, well, why don't you take out all the stuff that's in the way of your core flow, which is ask someone a question. So on the left here, you can see their initial design where the boxes in blue are the core business loop of asking someone a question and getting an answer. On the right, what they did is they moved all that stuff about creating an account and logging in and updating your profile to later in the process. They realized that if I send you a question by email, the act of you answering it is like saying, yes, I'd like an account on the system. Later on, if you want to go back to the application and say, I'd like to edit my account, well, you don't know your password. So what? Everyone knows how to do a password recovery. This simple change of moving the unnecessary steps later in the process changed their conversion rate from 25% to 90%. So two really important lessons. De-risk things quickly early on in the empathy stage, and then get everything out of the way that prevents people from accomplishing that sort of viral cycle or loop. So if you put all of this together, what we've got in the book that you guys are all holding um, is these five stages that companies go through and six business model archetypes. And we looked at six sort of fundamental ideas for business model. Software as a service, two-sided market, e-commerce transactions, and so on. Your business project or product is almost certainly not one of these. Amazon, for example, has a reviewing section. That's entirely user-generated content. They also have a two-sided marketplace. They also have an e-commerce store. So all of these things apply for you to build your own business model. But at the core of the book is, depending on what stage you're at, and depending on what model you're in, there is a metric that matters to you a lot, and you need to get it to a certain place before you should proceed. I said a metric. I think you should choose only one metric. And there's a very good reason for having chosen only one metric. I mean, it sounds weird, right? If you're running a business, you've got dozens of metrics to deal with. So why choose only one? Imagine you're trying to park a car. Cars have lots of metrics, right? I mean, they got mileage and gas gauge and oil pressure and electrical and vibrations and whether your blinkers are on. There's tons of data you're inundated with. But the only metric that matters when you're parking your car is distance from the vehicle or object behind you. When you are trying in the early stages of a company to grow, you should pick one thing, find the fastest, easiest, laziest way to de-risk that thing, and make sure you can get the business to that 
line in the sand before proceeding. That doesn't mean you aren't managing the other things by exception. Obviously, if you're running a business, you care about cash in the bank so you can make payroll. But that is not the thing you are currently trying to optimize for the business. If you get that metric to be where you want it to be, it will soon change. Because in a startup, the biggest problem you face is accomplishing focus. And this is also true of big companies. If you have a project and you're trying to be innovative, it's so easy to get distracted by other people's imperatives, by the other goals. It's very easy to lose sight of that initial goal that you had. We tell people to focus on this because having only one metric automatically dictates this kind of focus in the business. If you're going to change metrics and someone asks you to optimize for a different thing, you should know why. Metrics are like squeeze toys. When I grab a metric and I optimize it, the next metric naturally bulges out. If you're an e-commerce company, for example, and you've got a lot of traffic on the home page, the next metric is conversion rate, how many people put stuff in their shopping cart and then pay. So there's a very big chart here I'm not going to ask you to remember. Um, and I'll give you a URL that tells you all this data. But basically, for each of these stages, for each of these business models, there are one or two metrics that you will have to get to a certain place. And if you are online, take time to write down this, this URL, uh, bit.ly slash big lean table. Uh, this will take you to a much more detailed version of the table I just showed you as a PDF. Now, so far, we've talked about startups. And that's nice. And they're very, very good for understanding. When Clay Christensen wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, he studied the hard drive industry because someone told him hard drives are the fruit flies of the business world, in that a fruit fly is born, grows, and dies in a day. And so they're great for studying genetics. Startups are the fruit flies of innovation because they grow, get funding, and collapse beautifully. And so they're a great lens for studying these things. That does not mean the lessons of startups don't apply to big companies. So I'm going to pick on a restaurant for a while. <clears throat> Decidedly not a tech company, probably not a big company. Ask yourself, is the tip amount I've got on my receipts today a leading indicator of revenue in three months? I mean, if I get poor tips today, maybe I'm going to get bad reviews on Yelp, which means fewer people come to my restaurant and revenue comes down. It would be pretty good to know this, right? That would give me a three-month warning on whether my restaurant's revenues were collapsing. But most of the restaurateurs I've looked at do not do simple math like average tip and whether it's up or down per table or per meal over time. There's very good evidence that this is the kind of thing that will be a leading indicator of long-term revenue. But restaurants don't think that way. Why does every table get the same menu? In a restaurant, the day you know the least about your business is the day you launch it. And yet most restaurateurs take their menus out and laminate them. <clears throat> you should be printing out menus, possibly even using different fonts or different layouts for different tables to see which one maximizes things, if you think experimentally. The old cost of printing out menus, which was a high one-time cost, so you did it early on with a printer, the printing company, have collapsed. And now it's very easy for me to print out menus on a, on a laser printer each day and run experiments. And yet, restauranters don't think experimentally. There's good reason to think experimentally. If you look at the average lifespan of a Fortune 500 company, that company was on the S&P, uh, sorry, the Fortune 500 list for 75 years in 1950. It's now down to roughly 15 years. However, companies that try to grow their business by entering an entirely new business line tend to fail. Estimates are between 95 and 99 percent. That's a pretty bleak world. We have to find ways to reinvigorate our business to avoid the kind of disruptive innovations that are going to change things, and yet it's very hard to do so. Now, some of you may have seen Ansef's matrix of how companies innovate. You can either sell your current product to your current market better. That's called market penetration. You can sell a new product to your current market. That's called market development, which may include geographic exports and so on. But it can also mean new market segments. Um, you can sell a new product to your existing market. That's typically R&D, acquisition, M&A. Uh, or you can do something entirely new, a new product to a new market. And this is a startup. And the thing about a new product to a new market is it tends to have new business rules as well. So it's very hard to understand that new product, new market, using the lens of your current business model. Um, this has, in HBR and elsewhere, been reported as three different groups. Uh, core innovation, where uh, you are basically doing the same thing to the same people. Adjacent innovation, which is where you're sort of taking a baby step one degree away from your current market. And transformative, where it's an entirely new product and an entirely new market. So these things aren't binary. There's a spectrum in here of the degree of innovation. Innovation like this has been happening for a long time. And one of the problems, I think, with matrix, matrices like Ansos Matrix is that they are two-dimensional, product and market. 
In many cases, the innovation we see today comes not from the product and not from the market, but from the methodology, changing the model, changing the business. So when James Watt first built the steam engine, I learned this when I was in London a few weeks ago, he actually didn't just sell the engine. He'd sell you the engine, but he'd actually sell you mostly special parts and a set of plans. So you went and got your own lumber. There were certain bits that had to be machined with precision that he controlled. And then he charged royalties based on the amount of energy your engine generated, which meant that he had to build monitoring into the engine. Many of his innovations were not just the steam engine. They were the tools for measuring how much pressure and how much force and how long those engines ran so he could bill you a royalty. He delivered engine as a service. Now, a few years later, someone else figured this out. General Electric, which makes airplane engines, used to sell you an airplane engine. Now, the dominant model is they will lease you an engine as a service. You might pay, and I'm making up these numbers, you might pay $1,000 per engine hour for a working engine. And one day, General Electric will send you a part, and you'll go, what's this for? And they say, plug it in, we think your engine needs a new one. And you say, how do you know? And they say, because we've analyzed all the 777 engines across the world, and when they go through the weather you just did with the vibrations you just saw, they need one of these. And as a result, General Electric is seeing huge improvements not so much from its material science, but from its analytics pooled across customers. So General Electric has rediscovered Watt's idea and is now selling engines as a service. Now, the market's still air, uh, airplanes or airlines. The product is still engines. The model has changed dramatically. And so the problem I have with traditional product market innovation is it tends to overlook what is the dominant form of innovation I see in companies today, which is method innovation. If product is what you sell and market is who you sell it to, then method is how you sell it, how you deliver it, how you collect its value. Amazon, for example, is competing on how. There's good reason to believe that drones was just a really clever press stunt the day before Cyber Friday, but, uh, or Cyber Monday, sorry, but um, nevertheless, Amazon is the company that is constantly asking, how can I do this better, faster, more efficiently? They're still selling books to readers. Their innovations have not been going after new markets, although maybe there are now people who were hard of sight that can view a Kindle with bigger fonts. Maybe there are now new books coming out written by self-published authors. I would admit there's some innovation there. But most of the innovations have to do with automation and logistics and one-click purchases and so on. So let's take a step back and say, what if you were in a big company managing a portfolio of innovations? I talked about these three categories, and the reality is that every company has a spectrum of innovation across these three groups. And study after study shows that the level of investment distribution across those three groups that capital markets will tolerate is roughly 70% focus on core, which means doing what you're doing now better, 20% on adjacent, which means moving into a slightly new market, a slightly new product, or I would argue a slightly new method, and 10% transformative, which is moonshots. There's an approach for managing each of these kinds of innovation. My favorite for the core is something called the five mores model. Sergio Zyman was the um, chief marketing officer for Coca-Cola. Very funny, very strongly opinionated, very articulate guy. And he said marketing consists of this, selling more things to more people for more money, more often, more efficiently. That is the best definition of marketing I've ever heard. Many of the principles of lean analytics that we talk about in the book, this iterative approach to running little experiments, are very, very useful. I've got an idea for how to sell more things. I've got an idea for how to make more money on them. I've got an idea for how to increase, per, in, uh, increase purchase if, um, frequency. I've got an idea for how to reduce costs. Those are all things you can set up experiments and hypotheses for. You can use analytics to test for. You can crunch the data in ways that were previously out of our price reach. And you can often do it like, like LocalMind did with very, very cheap tools as a substitute for actually spending money on hard coding and building products. Tesco, for example, is doing sales of groceries. Tesco has a badge that they put on customers, uh, sorry, on employees, that allows the employee, shows the employee's name. It also allows the employee to scan uh, stuff that's happening in the store and get uh, price code information, inventory information more quickly. Very small device, but the exhaust, the data exhaust that comes from that product allows them to increase worker productivity, um, do comparisons in that, and learn what works really well for individual employees. So what metrics should you watch in the core? Well, in the core, you've got a business plan. You say, I think this will produce these outcomes in the next 12 or 24 months. You go into it assuming it will work. You have a very positive look. We have a good reason to think that this change in pricing will have the following based on our past evidence. 
but you should also know that the longer you take to build this core innovation and deliver it, the more likely it is the market will have moved. Uh, an example of this could be if you're a city that's doing parking tickets and you say we want to do online parking tickets. It's not huge, right? You're just doing what you did better. But you're going to measure very traditional metrics. This is, these are metrics the business is very familiar with. What's the ROI? What's the total cost of ownership? How many trouble tickets am I going to get? How long does it take to train people? The danger when you're doing core innovation is something called the local maxima. So if you think about most markets, you are sitting somewhere on a market landscape where a particular product to a particular market has a maximum level of efficiency. If you do optimization of your current metrics, in other words, you do the same thing you're doing, you just do better and better and better till the best you possibly can. You found the perfect price elasticity point, you found the perfect pricing, the perfect volume, everything is maximized, you are at what, what's called a local maximum. And this is often the problem with data-driven or analytics-driven efforts, is they find you the best possible world, but it's a lousy world. So global maxima, which means moving outside of that local perfect world by redefining something fundamental about the business, the market, the product, or the method, takes you to a new area, a global maximum. The challenge, if you're trying to innovate within a large organization, is that short-term investors absolutely hate going downhill like this. They can't stand it. Because on paper, it looks like you're going to decline. It looks like something is going down. Margins are worse. You're selling to a lower-end customer. And so politically, it's very hard to convince people that you want to move downhill away from the current local maxima to get to a bigger global maxima. And this is the fundamental idea and problem that Clay Christensen refers to in The Innovator's Dilemma. Companies are very, very good at going for their local maxima. Steve Blank famously said that a startup is an organization designed to search for a sustainable, repeatable business model. The corollary to that must be that a corporation is an organization designed to perpetuate a sustainable, repeatable business model. And that perpetuation is this upward force that takes you to the local maxima. Short-term investors hate going downhill. It takes a long-term investor like a Steve Jobs to say, there's a better world if we move to music players from PCs colored like fruit. Which brings us to the adjacent category. In the adjacent category, what you need to create is a learning organization, one that is able to do very efficient, very consistent, intentional research and development and intentional innovation programming. One example of adjacent innovation is the Procter & Gamble Magic Eraser. So this was originally a foam developed by BASF to reduce airplane vibration and noise. Someone in Japan used the foam as a cleaning product because it turns out when you rubbed it on clothes, it picked things up. Someone at Procter & Gamble saw this and said, this foam can be used as a cleaning product. Clearly, they had the same product, same foam composition. In fact, they sold it as exactly the same foam early on. But they sold it to a new market, no longer aviation market, now home cleaning market. That's an example of adjacent innovation. You can do product testing. You have a good understanding of the needs of people who want to clean things. You still sell it through your traditional channels, retail, shop sales on the shelves. But it's a genuinely new product. So if you're doing something adjacent, you're doing something new. You have a business model that you think will work. You assume it will change. Something about that will change, right? Uh, your ultimate use case may not be what you think it is. In many cases, people deliver an innovation, an adjacent innovation to market somehow, and then when it sticks, if you go and look, consumers are not using it in the way you intended. And that's an okay thing. The consumer is innovating alongside you. The metrics you need to answer early on here are things like, I have a bunch of questions about this market. Have I answered them? So my questions in that case might be, will people reject this product? Is it toxic somehow? Um, you may have um, questions about virality or word of mouth. How quickly will people tell their friends? How easy is it to explain this to a new uh, friend and, and spread the word? <clears throat> How sticky will user early adopters be? When someone buys it once, do they buy it as a novelty and never come back? Or do they buy it every week? What regulations are there around selling airplane foam to consumers for storage in their house? What's the total addressable market? Not the market I'm currently serving, the served addressable market. What's the total addressable market for this product? When you get over to the transformative side, this is when you're back to the crazy startup world I talked to at the beginning. Steve Blank's model, uh, description of searching for a business model. And I'm going to give you an example from someone I met here in town, Gary Hoberman. So MetLife is an insurance company, right? MetLife is busy trying to reframe itself because they know that life insurance is not that interesting a thing. For a number of reasons, life insurance is something that's often seen as a tax by people. 
They perceive that the rise of socialized medicine reduces the need for forms of insurance. The better ability to predict our future health care uh, uh, gives less the lead for long-term stuff. And the life insurance industry has tried to remake itself as the source of a legacy because people often buy term insurance. Now, I don't want to make any remarks one way or the other. I don't know that much about the insurance industry, but it's certainly an industry we don't think of as incredibly innovative. Gary's team has been allowed a lot of leeway to innovate. In fact, MetLife has a policy of, for every time someone cuts $10 million in the company, $6.6 .6 million goes into new projects. They no longer look at cost cutting as a way of getting rid of money, but a way of funding new things. One of the projects that's come out of this is something called MetLife Infinity. <clears throat> and this is a great example of innovation at work. Gary is reframing the company to say that the insurance company is the owner of your digital legacy. Because if you think about it, your life insurance is the legacy you leave to your kids. The last thing your family does is get around to see what grandpa left for them in the will. That is your legacy. And if you're willing to entrust that organization with your legacy, why not entrust them with sending a video message for my wife saying goodbye to you, my love? A little creepy, right? But also kind of cool. A little spine tingling. That's definitely not what I thought an insurance company did. But the more I think about it, the more I realize it's what an insurance company could do. They could move from settling my will and paying out to handling my life years after I've gone, sending my banking information and passwords and account information to my spouse. That's actually a pretty cool innovation. Now, new product, new market, yeah, this is very, very disruptive. They're treating this like a startup. But instead of going out and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars researching new markets, they could build an iPhone app and see what happens for a fraction of that cost. And so the, the functions of a startup, when properly curated as part of an overall innovation portfolio, can be incredibly disruptive to how businesses work. So when you're doing this kind of transformative innovation, you're looking at things like hoverboards and moonshots. This is like crazy big stuff, right? You have a business idea. You don't even nearly have a business model. It's just an idea, but you're assuming it's possible, and you hope that it will have the consequences you want. Uh, Taser, for example, got into the business of head-mounted cameras for police officers, which have all kinds of chain of evidence uh, uh, questions. They hoped it would be adopted. It turns out that this actually reduces violent incidents by both the perpetrator and the officer, dramatically, because they're both being watched. And the metrics that matter here are things like, how fast can I create a new prototype? How many people have I talked to? How many of my assumptions have been validated or repudiated? How many problems have I uncovered? How technically feasible is this? What hidden constraints do I not know about? Does this market even exist? It's a very different set of lenses from the adjacent innovation or the core innovation. The metrics for the three are very different. By definition, you are going to look at different metrics the further you are from your safe home turf. You're after a different behavior when you're doing transformative innovation. You're after a learning behavior, not a predictability behavior. So the metrics are vastly different. Large organizations, like this one, tend to make data that perpetuates things because large organizations are in the business of perpetuating a business model. So in many cases, innovators have to willfully ignore common wisdom at the outset, which is really hard for the managers of those innovators to do. They have to run a tremendous amount of interference. The entire organizational structure and the executive team needs to understand the purpose of willfully ignoring the metrics and the values that got them into their successful business model today. So I'm going to end with a few trips, tips and tricks that work for big companies. One is subversive thinking. You may have lots and lots of examples of things you could do to make the business better. Right? How do you choose them? Houston Airport had a problem. In Houston, the conveyor belt was taking nine minutes on average to bring the uh, suitcases from the airplane to the carousel. When they surveyed passengers, the number one complaint was, I have to wait too long for my bags. Remember those words, I have to wait too long for my bags. They spent millions of dollars overhauling the entire baggage supply system. They got it down from nine minutes to six minutes. Amazing effort. Then they surveyed people. Number one complaint, I have to wait too long for my bags. And then an enterprising civil servant decided to park the planes further away from the baggage carousel for, baggage carousel for a month. Complaints went to zero. Because they didn't say my bags take too long to come out. They said I have to wait too long. And people didn't mind stretching their legs for a couple of minutes walking to the baggage carousel. Now, let's say that with the power of hindsight, you're able to say I'm going to green light one of two initiatives, either retooling the entire airport supply chain or parking the planes a little further. Which one of those is easier to test? 
So when you're doing innovation, just like local mind looking at tweets here instead of building an app, you have to think subversively. You have to kind of think like a hacker. What's the lazy angle here? What's the way I can find this out that's counterintuitive? Companies that I have talked to, and I've talked to about 40 companies in preparing this stuff on innovation, succeed because they are subversive. They're looking for the way to get the system to do something it wasn't intended to. Here's another example. I was sitting in an airport um, restaurant in Minneapolis, and uh, the waitress gave me a receipt, and it said, thanks, Bambi, two eyes dotted with a little heart. And I thought, that's interesting, purple ink. I wonder if I tip more for purple ink. I wonder if she brought me a green pen if I would have tipped differently. And then I started thinking, because I'm a nerd, my friends pointed out, you should probably learn when waitresses are hitting on you. I didn't understand that part. <laughs> um, actually, he pointed that on stage at a 2,000 person conference, so it was a little embarrassing. Um, but I, I was thinking to myself, what would an organization need to do if it were trying to change the tip amount? It wouldn't be enough to say, please give people green or, or purple pens. How would the organization get the idea? Let's say an aspiring waiter or waitress said, hey, I've got this idea. That would have to be collected somehow as part of the innovation program. You'd have to change the system, open table or whatever it was that did reservations, to tell them to use a purple or a green pen so you got a good, nice, random sample. Otherwise, they might tend to use green for men and purple for women. You'd have to have a way of entering that data, rolling it up, and you'd have to have a known set of actions like issuing everyone green or purple pins. Just thinking about the organizational changes and the cultural changes it would take to allow a restaurant chain to do something that might increase its tip percentage by 2% and change its fortunes is a pretty good indicator of the kind of cultural changes you need to make for much more technical stuff. It's not more complicated than what color ink to use. Most of the challenges are cultural. How do I get an organization to ask the question and get the answer for what kind of ink should I use? One of the techniques that I've seen work well is the guys at DHL. DHL has a policy on innovation where they say, we are not going to ask, can we build a new product? They say, we're going to do a study. They frame what they're doing as a study. So for example, in the logistics business, lots of futurists and pundits like myself say, 3D printing is going to destroy your business. All you're going to do is ship plastic around. So DHL said, great, we're going to try and create a business that does 3D printing. And it didn't work very well. But because they never said, we're going to create a business, they said, we're going to do a study on 3D printing. How are you going to study it? By creating a business. This was viewed as a huge success. They wrote studies on the impact of 3D printing on logistics. They shared this data with customers. Every time some upstart comes along and claims they're going to kill them, they go, oh, no, 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 look at this. So they didn't say, we're going to have abject failure. In the case of a startup, when it's failed, you go away and the VC lost its money. In the case of a big company, transformative attempts and innovation, if framed like research projects and studies, are successful when they succeed and successful when they fail. The only difference is that when they're successful when they succeed, you accidentally created a new product. It's a very different way of getting approval for these processes. If the company likes to know things will be successful ahead of time, tell them I am absolutely 100% guaranteed to give you a study on this subject. The cost of doing the startup is probably cheaper than asking Nielsen to do the research. Unlike a VC or a startup, DHL knows that they thrive even if the initiative fails because they've learned. Another thing that works really well for data-driven companies is to not just collect the data, but actually chase it down. The woman on the left here is Jana Eggers. She was the uh, VP of uh, Marketing and Product, SVP of Product and Marketing at Blackboard. She set up the Innovation Lab at Intuit, and for a few years, she ran Spreadshirt in Europe. Spreadshirt is an on-demand t-shirt design company. And they do the Net Promoter Score, which is a measure of how many of your customers would recommend you to someone else on a very frequent basis. And one day, the net promoter score for Norway fell through the floor. Most people go, oh, the Norwegians don't like these t-shirts. You know, it must be Lillehammer or, or that TV show about watching fires burn or something. The Norwegians are weird. And they just discounted that and move on. She said, I won't accept that answer. She got on the phone to the Norwegian consulate and eventually to customs. Turns out two weeks before, they'd centralized all of their customs clearing. It used to be done in the regional post offices. Now it was being done centrally. Packages were getting held up. In talking to them, she found out how to properly fill out the form so they go through quickly. Problem solved. Many companies collect the data and don't follow it to where it leads them. The tenacity around a change, it's not enough to say something changed. You have to know why. This kind of tenacity about following the data to its conclusion is what separates companies that can innovate from those that can't. There are some other things that work well. Always be testing things. Something, something at Walmart does really well. They have a program called the Get on the Shelf program. 
Walmart puts a variety of different products out there and they get their customers to crowdsource those toys or games or new products and the winners go on the shelves. And guess what? They've got attention. They've got people who voted who might like to know the product is now available. This is a wonderful way of de-risking innovation and new products and building customer awareness for it. And it doesn't just have to be big companies. The coffee shop near my house often holds votes on topics. This one's a little absurd, but sometimes they will ask you, like, what coffee should we have here next month? They're gathering data. By the way, they also told me, because they check, that when they ask a question, tips go way up. The last thing I want to leave you with is this idea of taking baby steps. Because as an innovator, you can't just do big things. You've got to do them in a way that allows your market to get from where it is to where it wants to be. Netflix was always going to deliver video by network, right? That's why the name's Netflix, not envelope with the DVD in it flicks. But they knew that domestic broadband was not broadly available at the time they wanted to launch. So they did some math and found out that the cost of shipping envelopes, DVDs in it was low. You could build a customer base, you could work on the licenses for all the movies you want, and you could try to build the business. Envelopes were a baby step for Netflix. When Elon Musk put out the first Tesla, he was widely criticized for having built a sports car. He said in his first blog post, we don't think the world needs another expensive sports car. He said our product was going to be expensive no matter what it looked like, so we decided to build a sports car. This was the baby step to the Model S. Anybody remember why Twitter is 140 characters? Not some magic number. It's the length of an SMS minus the length of a username. You may forget it today, and I can't imagine what Twitter would be like if I got my SMS notifications. But when Twitter first launched, it was an SMS-based product because not enough of the market had smartphones. Netflix, Tesla, Twitter, these guys all found baby steps to get from what their idea was going to be back to the market as it was today. Your innovations need to include those kinds of baby steps. I spend much less time asking innovators and founders, what's your idea, and much more time asking them, what's your unfair advantage or your baby step that will get you to that market? So I want to leave you with this story of Archimedes. Anybody here know the story of Archimedes? Archimedes was a uh, very smart Greek. And uh, he worked for a king who was kind of mean. And the king asked someone to make a crown. And the guy brought the crown back. And the king went, feels kind of light. It better be gold or I'm going to cut your head off. Hey, Archimedes, tell me if this has the density of gold. And Archimedes went, oh, that's an interesting problem because it's an irregularly shaped solid. So I can't just measure it. How am I going to do this? So he went home and had a big bath. And the legend says that as he sat in the bath, the water level went up. And he went, Eureka, I've got it, and ran down the street naked proclaiming that he'd figured out how to measure the volume of an irregularly shaped solid. History shows that's actually not what happened. He had a bucket, and he had a lever, and he dunked something in and could measure it. He was smarter than that. But that's not the point of my story. By the way, the, the guy was lying. He lost his head. The king was vindictive. Um, that's not the point of my story. The point of my story is this, that I hope Archimedes had taken baths before. It was not the act of sitting in a bath that made Archimedes realize he knew how to do something. It was the king's act of asking the question that made him realize he was quite literally sitting in the answer. Once upon a time, in the absence of data, a leader was the person who convinced others to act. When there wasn't a lot of information around, when we weren't living in a society where we could Google our competitors in a heartbeat, find the answer we were looking for immediately, the leader was the Don Draper sitting there telling you the story of the carousel and the movements of your child and the thoughts cascading before you and, oh, I got hackles up my back. Okay, Don, I'm in. I'll vote. Right? That was the model of leadership. And in many ways, the people that walk the halls of power and sit at the boardroom table got there by being convincing in the absence of data. The challenge and probably the reason why we're seeing the disruption in Fortune 500 fortunes is that today, the leader is the person who knows which questions to ask. Because if you ask the right question, and you do so quickly, and you get the right answer quickly, you will out-innovate anybody else in a market where cycle time trumps scale.